Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Antonia, beautiful city. Thanks for hosting. Uh, you know, I, I feel like uh, um, many when we come here, ich, ein, ich bin ein Berliner. I think we're all Berliners, and I appreciate it, especially on this beautiful day in this beautiful building. So I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit of stuff that's been talked about today, and then some stuff we're do doing in Houston. Uh, the surgeons in the room, it will change your life. So make sure you're paying attention at the end. Uh, uh, I know not many retina surgeons here, but it is Heidelberg related, so I wanted to share it with you. So this is uh, Spectralis Today, and I am the primary retina doctor for NASA. And so when I think ISS, I think somebody's going to the International Space Station. So this is what the International Space Station looked like in 2000 when we first sent humans up there. And this is what it looks like today, right? They keep adding on different components. And so it's the same thing like, like Heidelberg Spectralis. I remember when we got the first images and we go, wow. And then it just keeps getting better and better. So, you know, what we have today is some really cool imaging. And I'm not gonna talk about this much because you have it. I mean, as processors get better and, and computers get faster, you can, you can uh, uh, render these things faster. Uh, again, type 2 CNV uh, after, after VEGF. The cool thing is being able to render in 3D and, and to see where the membrane is. Uh, here you have uh, a, a type 3 CNV. Again, you see the polyps uh, on, on, the, on the ICG. Uh, but then to see the membrane growing up through with 3 tree re reconstructions. So I have uh, one of the competitors' machine, the Zeiss uh, uh, um, $250,000 uh, Zeiss, I get images like this, but it takes my NASA programmers like to be able to render them for me. Like I can't do it from the raw machine. And so I really appreciate uh, the, uh, the ability with the Spectralis to have an interface that's workable. Imaging tomorrow, uh, I'm not gonna uh, deal on this because uh, my great friend Frank Holt showed some of this. You know, the three micron stuff's amazing. Uh, uh, they're using higher power, they're using a longer wavelength, uh, uh, and, and they're able to get just amazing imaging. Just show you briefly, uh, here you see, uh, you know, the near-infrared reflectance is what we're used to, but you click on it, you can actually get an on FOSS image that's that quick. And so I think it could revolutionize our geographic atrophy measurements. I'll leave that to Frank since he's the expert. Uh, the other thing you see is, is the hyperreflective foci, the serora, you know, the ability to see these layers uh, in histopatholo histopathologically, like Christine has seen forever, uh, but uh, it's just amazing. So this is a company that Heidelberg acquired, and I know enough to be dangerous, so don't be uh, too critical, uh, but they use a holographic OCT, and what that is is they use computational aberration correction, uh, some fancy stuff where the imaging really looks like adaptive optics. So, just to show you some of this, uh, what's happening is because the phases of, of light are coming out, they, they, they account for that because of the pulsation of the eye, and et cetera. And they're able to give you this adaptive optic stuff. Uh, uh, you know, we have giants in, in the room like Jim Fujimoto and others that uh, uh, actually know, can explain how this works, uh, but it's just really cool that we're getting closer to the cellular level. Uh, they also do uh, uh, activation of photoreceptors. Uh, this is a different company that they acquired, but they're putting it together uh, so that you can activate and see cone responses and, and identify which cells are which. Uh, the other thing is there's this thing called pulse wave imaging. And because the vessels, particularly the veins, pulse, the volume of the, of the retina, the inner retina, uh, goes up and down. So what they're able to show is this uh, uh, periodic Thickening changes in the neuronal retina. Notice the vein pulses way more than the artery. Uh, kind of looks like a diastolic, systolic pulse, and that's exactly what it is. Uh, and then showing you that the curve of the vein changes over time, because when the, in the systolic part of the vein, you actually have a, a more of a curve than not. So what they're able to do is to put all this together in this handy-dandy home health thing, that you probably don't want to drop and you probably don't want to have to ask what it costs, but that's a different story. Uh, they say it's compact and inexpensive. I bet it wasn't inexpensive for Heidelberg, but 
Um, so look at this imaging it can give you. Uh, uh, again, this is probably a college student with no cataract and not shaky like my patients, but uh, still amazingly that you're able to get what it does is it's doing on FOS C scans continuously. It's not doing multiple B scans that it then uh, corrects for. Again, they then do the computational aberration and, and can get you images that look amazingly like adaptive optics. So, also want to talk about Heidelberg Appway. Uh, this is uh, an interface that Heidelberg's developed uh, so that you can have external applications and plug in. Uh, the applications, uh, uh, Ursula uh, was supposed to be here, uh, but she's not. Her company does amazing work with it. Uh, in Texas, we've mainly worked with uh, uh, the, the Baron company, uh, Retina AI, uh, and uh, both have had amazing stuff. What I'm going to show you in Texas is what we did. I was skeptical. I was skeptical that I could take just images off the fly. I've got the world's best photographers, but send them anything. Can they computational give me subretinal fluid, sub, or, you know, sub RPE fluid into retinal fluid, could they measure geographic atrophy off the near infrared reflectance? And so just to show you some of the initial work they did with our, our, our test pilot, uh, they did, we looked at 9,800 B scans that we sent them uh, from mainly Texas. And you got reports like this, uh, where you see subretinal fluid, intraretinal fluid. Just to, here's a patient, you know, it's identifying those areas. And, uh, and quantitatively being able to identify subretinal fluid and intraretinal fluid, the advantage of that is if, if, if you have a treatment paradigm where you're seeing patients a million times, is one drug potentially better than the other because of different angiogenic properties? Here's another one with a lot of edema. Here we tested one with kind of a bad image, still did pretty good. Uh, and so I think it has a lot of hope, and they're, they're using artificial intelligence through this app way. Here's one of the coolest things they do. They, they're able to measure the geographic atrophy off the near-infrared reflectance or the, uh, 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 the, the autofluorescence. And, and, and these curves, they generate the curves down below. And I've got a pointer here, but I don't know if it works. So maybe not. See that green? That's the curve of what it looks like. And what they're doing is they're then mapping out what that geographic atrophy will look like as it grows over time. And with artificial intelligence, they can show you, will that patient, when will that patient lose his fovea in theory? Obviously, we've never tested this in real time, uh, but it's really cool. So modern color imaging, uh, I know I may get thrown out of the room, uh, but I cannot live without my Heidelberg spectralis. I can also not live without my Optos wide field. And, and what I'm showing you is what's just out, and we've had it for a while, it's just amazing. This is a retinal detachment that, uh, that came into my clinic. And what's wrong with this picture? What is different about this picture? And here I do a pneumatic. You see the bubbles. You see I've moved some of the fluid. This is two hours after the pneumatic. So this is imaging literally two hours after I've given an anesthetic. And it's probably, probably 45 minutes to an hour. I don't wait around that long. Here's the next day, I've flattened the macula. You can see that subretinal fluid off to the temporal side. Here's, you know, here's a week later, you're starting to see my cryo scar. The colors are perfect, right? The, the RGB Optos will change the world. Hear me now, believe me later. This is two weeks out, a successful pneumatic retinopexy. This is four weeks out. You start to see the, some vitreous cineresis. I call it, you know, there's a very famous uh, 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 Supreme Court justice, the notorious Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I, they call it RGB, I call it the notorious RBG. So this is just one example. Do you like to see green without pressure? Or do you like to see white without pressure, right? So this is a patient with retinoschisis and it's a beautiful building with a lot of light coming through so you may not see it but you can see depths of retinoschisis so much better with the increased light in that blue pathway. Again, here's lattice degeneration. In a darker room, you can see exactly the retinal holes. Uh, it's, it's gonna be a game changer. Uh, and uh, it's not produced by my good friends in Heidelberg, uh, but I hope in some way we can integrate in the future uh, because I think all of us that really love high-end imaging are using a lot of this and we're using a lot of our spectralis. So back to spectralis. So they have a, have a chance of getting invited back again. 
What we're going to talk about today is interesting. PVD status is the most critical thing for vitreomacular interface staging and planning. And people look in a dark room with a, with, a, with a lens looking for, it is going on its own. I'm killing you. Uh, this is Vogt's ring or Weiss's ring. Which one is it? Leopold Weiss identified it uh, uh, with a uh, direct biomascropy in 1897, Vogt with a slit lamp in 1930. Uh, uh, if you use a slit lamp, you should probably call it a Vogt's ring. Most people call it a Weiss's ring. If you see it uh, on an OCT, we don't know what to call it. Maybe we should call it a Giovanni Steringi or a Frank Holtz or a Dave Brown, but anyway. Uh, here you, you can use a lens and make it better. You can use ultrasound. Uh, Uccino showed us in 2001 that you can see it with OCT. We looked at 2002 eyes. We saw with the Heidelberg Spectralis OCT2 and RNFL that you could really see this interface well. So what we did was we, uh, uh, we divided stages. We did 2,000 eyes. First stage, no RNFL separation. This is a six-year-old. This is a 36-year-old, absolutely no separation. Beginning stages are here. And the first thing you see is separation between the tethered vessels. The, the posterior hyaloid face is tethered at the vessels. We all know that surgically. And so you see these linear bands where it's tethered. Uh, at stage C, and let me go back to this, stage C is the first place it separates is the papillomacular bundle. And that's because there's AP traction. And because there's a large arc between the two vessels, this is the place that separates the first. This is stage C, it still has foveal adhesion. Uh, this separates more with traction. Here you see some beginning vitromacular adhesion. We call this the stingray sign. You'll see why. As it pulls, if it doesn't separate from the fovea, you get vitromacular traction and impending macular hole. Here you see some outer layer macular hole. We call this C plus when it separates from the fovea. And note that it always separates from the fovea either simultaneously or before the nasal retina. And this previously is not really known to retina surgeons, that it's the nasal retina that holds at the tightest. It makes sense if you're binding to the vessels, you have way more vessels on the nasal side than you do in the papillomacular bundle. Here you see a patient that I, with VMA stage C, I injected uh, anti-VEGF. They got a PVD within that month. And let me show you what this looks like. And it looks to me like Mr. Sting on uh, Pixar. So when it separates, you can either do it in a happy way or it can make a macular hole. Here, in most patients, it's still attached to the nerve. Here's our oldest patient, 95 years old, still attached to the nerve. When it looks like this, that V-shaped, if you can see it at all, it's still attached. Because when you do a volume scan, it's just you have a funnel. Our RNFL is a few millimeters out, but it's really the vessels at the nerve that hold it the tightest. This is stage D done. It's dark everywhere. It's usually not dark in my clinic. There's usually a few cells from blood from the PVD. Here we looked at stage by age, and what you see is that the ranges are way larger than we thought. We see the beginnings of PVD in 30% of people under 20. We see 60 and 70 year olds, 30% don't have a PVD. If you correlate that to patients with vitreomacular traction or, or, uh, or macular hole, you see that it's the ages of, we expect macular hole, but that's the C and C+. Plus. It's interesting, this was actually published uh, uh, in 1950 and then 1970, that it's the actual, the first part that separates uh, is, is the papillomacular bundle, and then the nasal area is later. Now I'm going to show you briefly, I know my time's almost over, how do we use this in the office? For the surgeons in the room that don't know how to use a Heidelberg, you click glaucoma, you click RNFL, this is the off-the-shelf, the, the pre-op RNFL is your treasure map. Plan your vitrectomy deliberately. Look before your, your surgery. And what do I mean by that? Here you see that the superiors to the left, the inferiors to the right. 
Here you have a macular hole. Uh, you see where is it separated the highest? It's separated over the superior arcade. So plan your vitrectomy to engage over the superior arcade. Engage superiorly, and here I'm doing it surgically. I go right to where it is. We typically train fellows go nasally. It's usually where it's stuck the tightest. It's actually probably less safe there. Here you have, voila, a PVD. Here's an epiretinal membrane. Many epiretinal membranes are not attached, detached at the nerve. Here you see there's only the papillomacular bundle separated, so counterintuitively, the safest place to engage is in the papillomacular bundle. Here you see me engaging the papillomacular bundle, creating a PVD. We have a lot of fun as surgeons that some of you medical retina guys don't get. But. Lastly, I show you a MACOF surgical plan. Uh, if you look at the RNFL, the highest part is the papillomacular bundle. It's counterintuitive that you'd go over mobile retina, like that's the scariest place to go if you're teaching a fellow. But it's actually the safest place because it's the place where the vitreous is furthest away. And how do you see it? You see it with a 15-second RNFL that no surgeon ever gets before they plan a vitrectomy. And this is often the hardest part of the vitrectomy is creating that PVD. So in conclusion, the Heidelberg RNFL made for glaucoma accurately stages PVD. 83% uh, of macular holes are that where it's still attached to the nerve nasally. Papillomacular bundle always separates before the fovea or, or nasal nerve. And the historical ranges of PVD are too narrow. Vitreous separation begins in most eyes before they're 30. And 35% of septuagenarians do not have a total PVD. Again, use your Heidelberg preoperatively. Plan your vitrectomy deliberately. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.